something you do every year, ma'am? Uh, no, sir. We only have guest lectures, sir. But uh, since it is online this time, we thought we'll go for a faculty development program, sir. That's great. So good evening, all of you. A warm welcome to you all on day six of the seven day faculty development program on literary theory. Today we have with us Professor Daniel David, head department of English, SF Stream, Madras Christian College. So, so sir has visited our campus a few years ago for a guest lecture and our association with sir has been a long one. But then personally, as I keep telling you every day, today I would like to say that my life has been immensely blessed because of the presence of my teachers. Though I cannot out and out call myself a student of Professor Daniel David, I do have some anecdotes to share with you. The other day I was telling you about this NETSET program that was initiated by National College Trichy. Uh, some 10, 11 years ago. At that point of time, we were all working in SF College and the particular college where I was working, a battalion of faculty, we were preparing for this program. But then initially we couldn't make it all the way to Trichy because it was an extended program for seven or eight days and we couldn't stay there for that long. So we decided why not invite those professors to our college to take class. Of course, uh, we just thought we will give it a try. We were not sure, but then we were very lucky because Dr. Bennett and along with him, Professor Daniel David visited our campus. In fact, he has visited our campus a couple of times. I remember sir even staying over for two or three days, right. a Friday, Saturday and a Sunday. And uh, uh, what should I say? There are very many unique qualities about sir as a teacher. Since it was on a weekend, sir would casually walk in with a t-shirt. He will not have any book or notes in his hand and he would go on for hours and hours together teaching us literary criticism and literary theory. And there is his unique teaching style where he would start with a literary theory and he would go on to give an example, such a commonplace or a mundane example to teach literary theory. After giving the example, he would look around. If he is not satisfied by the reaction on our face, he would say, wait, wait, let me give you another example. And he would go on and on. I still preserve all those notes of Sir's class that I attended. Uh, in fact, on the last day of the program, when he came for three days, he was supposed to wind up his class by five in the evening. Uh, exactly at that time, there was a very heavy downpour. I'm not sure if sir remembers all that. We uh, literally couldn't uh, budge out of the lecture hall. And sir said, what is the point? My train is at midnight. I will just continue. And he went on to teach for another two hours more because the rain continued until then. Sir taught us formalism at that time. So all this is really unforgettable. So many people like us, we were able to scale net JRF plainly because of people like Professor Daniel David, who gave us so much. In fact, this particular information, I have not even shared it with many people. Mm, sir, after coming all the way and teaching us, he refused to take an honorarium. So that is Professor Daniel David for you. So in fact, even yesterday, uh, he called me in the evening and he went on to tell as to how he was going to proceed with his lecture. He gave me a blueprint. So sir's selflessness, dedication, uh, how meticulous he is. If we could emulate some of these qualities, I'm sure we will all reach great heights. So I'm extremely happy that uh, sir has accepted our invitation and is here as a part of this faculty development program. Thank you, sir, ever so much. You're welcome, and, you're always welcome. Yes, sir. Sir has decided to speak on structuralism today now, once again, structuralism as a theory and practice is something very important. Why? Because uh, this literary theory, for the first time, it said that we shouldn't look at things or rather understand things in isolation, but we have to understand it in the context of larger structures. Uh, it may be a textbook, 
or it may be a culture that we are talking about, but we should never look at its individual qualities, but the larger structure. I am sure uh, by learning about the structuralism today, we will kind of round off because we have learned so many literary theories in the previous days. So this knowledge of uh, the knowledge of this particular theory will kindly uh, will kind of uh, round off all the knowledge that we have uh, derived from the previous days. So I am extremely eager and curious along with all of you to listen to sir. But uh, before that, I call upon uh, Dr. Mrs. Danalakshmi, Assistant Professor from the Department of English to deliver a formal welcome address. Thank you all of you and good luck. Thank you, Madangi. Good evening, everybody. I take great pleasure in welcoming each and every one of you for the literary exercise conducted by the Literary and Debating Association, Department of English, PSJ Krishnamal College for Women, Coimato. The motivating dreams of the visionary founders, Sri G. R. Govindarajalu and Srimati Chandraganti Govindarajalu are the driving force that makes the college set high standards under the leadership of Sri G. Rangaswamy and Dr. R. Nandini. The guidance of our secretary, Dr. N. Neshwada Devi, our principal, Dr. S. Nirmala, and Dean, Dr. R. Padmavati, has made the department to facilitate upgradation of knowledge, import skills through various programs under the leadership of Dr. Sushi Mary Matthews and the Literary and Debating Association faculty organizer, Dr. V. Madhiki. Today is the sixth day of the seven-day FDP program on literary theory, and the guest of the day is Professor Dr. Daniel J. David. Thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation to enlighten us with your lecture. You're Professor welcome. David, sorry. You're sorry. welcome. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Professor David began his career in St. Philomena's College, Mysore, and later joined Bishop Heber College, Trichy. He moved to Madras Christian College in 2010 and is currently heading the Department of English, SF Stream, Madras Christian College. Publication is one of his forte and, has pub and he has published numerous articles in national and international journals. He has served as a resource person in various conferences, seminars, workshops all over India. He is a resource person for many refresher courses conducted by the Academic Staff College, University of Madras. And he has been a part of uh, Board of Studies and has served as an external subject expert for various universities. His areas of interest include critical theory, narratology, practical theater, and fantasy fiction. Welcome, sir. And all of us are eagerly waiting to listen to your deliberations. Thank you so Thank much, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Let me take this opportunity in welcoming all faculty who are a part of this faculty development program. Thank you for your enthusiastic participation. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Over to you, Madhinti. Ma'am, thank you, ma'am. So over to you, sir. We'll begin the session. Thank you so much, ma'am. I bring the greetings of the Madras Christian College and particularly, particularly the Literati, the English Association of the self Man Stream of Madras Christian College to you. And at the outset, I would like to congratulate and seriously appreciate, I'd like to place this on record. I'd like to appreciate and uh, congratulate both the management of the Krishnamal College for Women, as well as the organizing team that has put together this FDP. I really don't know if you understand the magnitude of what this college has done. Now, from what I understand, there are about a thousand participants from across this country. And uh, what you are doing for the, the, for the, for, for, for the intelligentsia, the academia of uh, English literature is immense in this way because you've got very eminent scholars, people like Dr. Rufus, Dr. Uh, Ganesh and uh, Dr. Joseph Doreraj. Dr. J Joseph Doreraj is a man I admire. So it is wonderful for you have, to have conducted this. And I would like to praise on record my uh, congratulations and appreciation for what you have done. Thank you so much for what you've done. And most of all, <coughs> thank you for inviting me 
to be a resource person in this uh, meeting. And uh, it is with trepidation that I come because I am to be sharing the I'm, I'm, I'm to be sharing the panel with people like Do Dr. Joseph Doreraj, and that is not easy. And uh, this is going to be this is being live streamed on YouTube, and that increases my trepidation. And the third factor is that I am not lecturing to students here. I'm talking to what I might call an enlarged family of colleagues, and uh, you know most of what I'm going to tell you already. Otherwise, you wouldn't be professors. So what can I give you? That is what is bothering me. And I hope this session is going to be worthwhile. And uh, I would like to inform Dr. Madangi that uh, uh, she knows my modus operandi, the way I operate. So at the end of the session, I would like a feedback because uh, it's such a big responsibility for that for such an event, I have been called as a resource person and I want everybody to have some kind of a takeaway. And uh, uh, I would like to have a feedback from the participants as to whether they found the session useful at all. So that is by way of introduction. Now, in our department, in the self-finance stream in Madras Christian College, uh, which started a BA English Language and Literature program in uh, 2014, we have got used to one mode of operation and that is to start asking preliminary questions. Uh, in fact, I was discussing this with a friend of mine from who's the head of another department, and he's a very good friend of mine. And he said, why would you get down to such elemental questions? Questions like, uh, what is literature? Now, I do not know if any of your colleges follows this, but in our, in our college, this is and because I'm sharing this with colleagues. Uh, in our college, we found this to be tremendously useful. Now, when our first year students come into the campus, one of the issues that we face is this. You see, they are not, they are not specialists in English language or literature, the way, for instance, a zoology student is or a commerce student is. They have studied just part two English, and they are suddenly thrown into this core of English literature. And many a time they are at sea. They have no clue at, uh, as to what is going on. So what we have in our college is when the first years come in, when the freshers come in, they are given an orientation which lasts almost a week in which we familiarize them, in which we initiate them into what our program is all about. Our program is called BA English Language and Literature. So basically, I'm the one who does that. And I have to take each of these entities apart. And I have to talk about I have to talk about what we mean by English. What do you mean by English? Who are the English people? And believe me, if you're going to start asking questions like that, you will be exploring areas that you and I as conventional students of literature will not imagine existed. And then we have to go to the next issue. What is this thing called the English language? Where did it come from? What are the influences on it? And then literature. And there we get into, that is the question that I raised with my friend. And he said, why would you get to something so elemental? What do you mean by literature? And if you're going to look at the Oxford English Dictionary, you'll get about six different meanings of literature. And I have to tell my students, listen, that is not the way we operate. Each of those definitions of literature in the Oxford English Dictionary starts with writing about, writing about, writing about. Now, that is not what our program is all about. because our program will, in, uh, will include oral traditions. It will include cinema, because one of the important aspects of our program is, uh, is text to screen. What happens when a text moves? For instance, the Prisoner of Azkaban, uh, Harry Potter, is prescribed uh, for, the, for, the, for the first years. And what happens when we move from the text of J.K. Rawlings into the silver screen? What happens there? So, that will be part of literature for you. So I have to discuss this with, with them. Now, I'm not used, though, for one and a half years, almost, I have been uh, during, uh, doing online teaching. Uh, and I'm grateful for this platform because it has made the restrictions of, uh, it has negated the restrictions of this COVID-19 situation and permitted this program to go on. But one of the things that I miss is that I'm not able to interact. 
I'm not able to talk to you. Right now, I'm going to start with a fundamental question. And I wish somebody would unmute and speak to me. I wish somebody would. Uh, how familiar are you with, for the past five days, you've been dealing with critical theory. Right now, I just want to know how familiar are you and how, how comfortable are you with, with critical theory as against cri literary criticism? Can somebody unmute, please? Okay. Participants who wish to answer, please interact. People, if you don't interact, I don't know whether you're here or not. Okay. Yashoda, can you please unmute? Sir, very good evening, sir. Good evening, ma'am. Ah, sir. Actually, they're really, they're really helping uh, me a lot, sir. Okay. I okay. teach for degree students. Okay. Uh, actually, I teach language English. Okay. Uh, but these uh, theory, no, so literary theory. Okay. They are like adding extra information. Okay. Okay. But can you tell me? Theory do you know the distinct? Do you know the distinction between critical theory and literary criticism? No, sir. Uh, Satya Krishna Sundar uh, has raised her hand. Sir, very good evening, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Uh, sir, uh, um, sir, sorry for asking. Uh, can you please repeat the question, sir? There, there is there is difference between yeah, criticism is, and theory. Yeah, there is a distinction between literary criticism and critical theory. Now, do you are you aware of that? Yeah, um, sir, uh, theory we can understand about uh, how we can um, approach a text rather than. Uh, how we can understand it. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, criticism, uh, like um, uh, others' perspective of uh, understanding about what they have uh, uh, okay. uh, approaching that text. For example, if you're taking uh, uh, any of a literary genre, like any drama and poetry and uh, um, whatever it is, okay. uh, we, we, we supposed to be not to take... Uh, uh, there is uh, not to take uh, directly to the to students. It, it it's about uh, um, it, it's about uh, uh, what we can uh, systematic approach uh, another okay. perspective to, okay. through any of a genre. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a person called Vinu Vincent. Vinu Vincent still muted. Uh, there are a number of people. Yeah, yeah. Good evening, sir. Yes. Uh, okay. uh, as per my knowledge, critical yeah. theory yes. does not uh, belong in between the literature. Critical okay. theory Thank belongs you. to a Thank wide you. variety of Thank areas. You. Thank you. Thank you but so much. Thank you so much. You're absolutely right. There. Thank you so much. And uh, Professor Sumati? Professor Sumati? There's Professor Sumati, there is uh, Professor Uma, Professor Suman, and there's one more person. I'm sorry, I'm not able to get the name. I'm not able to pronounce it. I don't want to mispronounce names. Good evening, evening uh, ma'am. Tell me. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, critical uh, theory, I think the theory is laid down by the various critics and literary criticism is when we apply those theories in our uh, on our text or... Uh, Poems or critical, critically, when we analyze those texts, that is called literary criticism. Okay. After okay, reading fine. those theories, we can apply these things. Okay. Okay. Fine. I'll come back to that in just a moment. Uh, one or two others. I'm sorry, I can't listen to all of you because I don't have time. But just one more person, please. Uh, there's a person okay. from the no northeast. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Yes. Yeah. Am I audible, sir? Yes, you are. You are. So uh, literary theory or critical theory is about uh, a general, a general a layman or a common man can okay. even interpret or okay. study a text. But okay. criticism seems to be done by professional or erudite or expert in the particular okay. field. Okay, you're close enough. Okay, thank you so much. So thank you so much. I'm sorry, the others, I don't have time to listen to you. So you can put down your hands, please. 
and I shall continue with this. Now, uh, from the answers that you have given me, I have a feeling like I have to brief you first on what we mean by literary criticism, at least what I mean by literary criticism as against critical theory. Okay, now you've got to understand one thing. Uh, when I say critical theory, the term literary doesn't come in there. It is critical theory. It is not literary. Okay, of course, there are, uh, there are, there are people who will, who will call it literary theory as well. There are people who will call, call it that as well. But what I'm looking at is critical theory per se. Right? So that is one thing I want you to keep in mind. Now, try to talk about the difference between literary criticism and critical theory. Now, first of all, I want you to understand, literary criticism operates on a few parameters. Okay, literary criticism is analysis of a text. We all know that. We're doing it every day in class. Whether, like one of you told me, you teach part two English, or whether you teach, teach major, it doesn't matter. We are always engaged in analyzing and interpreting texts. But it goes beyond that when it comes to literary criticism. When it comes to literary criticism, uh, there are few functions that criticism has to perform. The first of those is prescription. The first of those is prescription telling you what should go into the text, or in other words, subject matter. What should go into the text? What is appropriate for literature? So what should go into the text? That would be subject matter. And how that subject matter has to be expressed. There we are talking about form. Okay, so we are talking about, about one. We are talking about the, the, the material that goes in, the material that goes in and also the structure that it is going to take or the form that it is going to take. Right? Now, the classic examples of uh, critics in this sense of prescribing both content and form or structure would be Plato and Aristotle. Aristotle's poetics, that would be it, coming right down to the 20th century or 21st century even. Now, they would be critics in that sense. But then when we move away from them, and I've got a reason for why I, I, I'm, I'm holding them distinct. And the reason is basically this that these are not literary figures. They're not literary figures. And when we move into the next section of, uh, of literary critics, we'll move into, into a group of people whose, whose background is literary, whose background is literary. And the father of English criticism, of course, is Sir Philip Sidney. And we've got to understand, when we talk about Sir Philip Sidney and his apology for poetry, and if you're going to read the Apology for Poetry, uh, over the lockdown, I sat down and read through the Apology for Poetry all over again. Okay, just simply because as a student, I read it, of course, but now I wanted to know for myself for now, what actually it is as a teacher after so many years of teaching experience. And I, I had to ask myself the question, why? Why was this man writing this at this point of time? And I think the reason for that is that the medieval age and coming down into the Renaissance was dominated by, by Platonic philosophy. It was dominated by Platonic philosophy because the Christian theologian called St. Augustine of Hippo, who is one of the foundations of Christian theology, whatever, whatever sect it may be, whether it's going to be Roman Catholicism or whether it's going to be Protestantism or whatever it may be. Now, uh, he is the foundation along with a couple of others whom I don't have to mention. But St. Augustine of Hippo had been groomed in rhetoric, and he had been groomed uh, in Platonic philosophy. So a whole lot of Platonic philosophy had scraped off into Christian theology. And that dominated people's thinking. Now, given that uh, 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 Sir Philip Sidney had to, had to defend poetry against the, the accusations that Plato had brought, that is the reason why he wrote that. And then you go on into thinking about all the other literary critics. You think about Samuel Johnson, and then you think about Alexander Pope, and you talk about Dryden, and then you think about uh, William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and then coming down to Matthew Arnold, and then going on to T.S. Eliot, and F.R. Leavis, and I.A. Richards. Now, when you talk about all these people, 
they have literature as their background. When I talk, when I talk about F.R. Levis as well as I.A. Richards, they were professors of English literature. So they have a literary background. So that is the second issue, right? Which means that they will automatically become two things. One, they become apologetic in the sense that they are defending their form of literature. They're defending their form of literature. Now, that's a very important point. And it's quite obvious, isn't it? When you look at uh, the preface to the lyrical ballads, what Wordsworth openly says is that he is trying to defend his form of poetry. So that is, that is Wordsworth. The same thing applies to Biographia Literaria. It's a literary biography of, of Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And then you move on to Matthew Arnold. Right? Uh, and you move on to T.S. Eliot and all of them, and particularly Henry James and uh, uh, Virginia Woolf. When you talk about Henry James and Virginia Woolf, they are trying to, particularly Henry James, is trying to defend his form of fiction, which is realism, which is realism. And Virginia Woolf is trying to defend her, her brand of fiction versus science fiction of Arthur Conan Doyle and others. So they are... Actually, what they're doing is, if, my, if I might use it in commercial terms, they are basically trying to sell their form of literature. That is what they're basically trying to do. Now, that, so that is the second aspect of literary criticism. First, it is prescriptive. It tells you what actually must go, uh, must go into literature and how it must be expressed. The second, it is apologetic in the sense that it is defending the individ individual critic's form of, of uh, writing. So that's the second point. The third thing that it does is it evaluates. The third thing that literary criticism does is that it evaluates. So it tells you what should be considered literature and what should not be. Now, this tradition goes back to Aristotle. It starts from there. And it comes right down. These are the people, literary critics are the people who frame the canon, who decide what has to be taught in the classroom, what has to be taught in the university, what do students have to write their examinations on in the university, what can you do your PhD on. It is decided by literary critics, basically, or rather it has been for so long. And now I hope that the trend is changing. Right. So they evaluate them and they say that a text is good or it is not. A text can be considered to be canon, what can be recognized by a university, or it cannot. Okay, so that and that, the classic example I can give you, give you for that is Matthew Arnold. Now, Matthew Arnold in, in his fun, function of critic, functions of criticism makes this very clear. He says, uh, you see, if you're going to look, look at the literary output of, of English, now, England has nothing to be ashamed of when it comes to drama, because we've got a colossus sitting out there called William Shakespeare. And when it comes to poetry, again, there's nothing that English literature has to be ashamed of, because again, we've got a colossus sitting there, and that is uh, John Milton. But when it comes to fiction, Matthew Arnold argues that he says, England, England can never talk about great fiction. England can never boast about great novelists. He debunks people like Thackeray and Dickens and Jane Austen and the others. And he says, you, England cannot produce novelists of the caliber of the continental writers. Writers, uh, 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 writers like Flaubert, for example, from France, Madame Bovary, and the intensity that he is able to capture in Madame Bovary or the vast expanse, the large and vast canvas that, uh, that Leo Tolstoy is able to command in his war and peace. He says that's not possible for the simple reason that England has not produced any great critics of fiction. And isn't it true? Um, again, maybe somebody can unmute. Can somebody tell me who was the first person to write anything at all in English? about how fiction is to be written. Can anybody tell me how fiction should be written? Who is the first critic in that sense? Or I might even say theorist or even narratologist. 
Okay, uh, Vijay Babu has raised his hand. Vijay Babu, can you unmute? Okay, there are a number, number of people. Arubati Pradeep. Yeah, can somebody un unmute? E.M. Foster, sir. E.M. Foster, okay, great. Aspects of the novel? Aspects of novel, yeah. Aspects of the novel, yes. But but uh, again, Dr. Arubati? Sir. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, tell me, sir. Yeah, aspects of novel. Okay, aspects of the novel by uh, E.M. E. Foster. E.M. Foster, okay, thank you. So I'm sorry. No, 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 thank you. But I have to say, I'm sorry, I'm just moving on. I'm sorry, because I don't have time. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm not able to talk to, to the others. I'd so love to talk to all of you individually. I'm sorry, I don't have the time. Now, actually, no. Do you know who was the first person to talk about how to write fiction? It was, uh, you can put down your hands, please. The first person to talk about how to write fiction in English was Henry Fielding. In case you don't know, it was Henry Fielding in his novel called Tom Jones. In his novel called Tom, Tom Jones, he has done something very interesting. I don't know how many of you have read the novel, but it is prescribed for our students. And uh, in Tom Jones, Tom Jones is made up of 13 books. It's divided into 13 books. And the first chapter of each book, I tell my students very clearly, the rest of the novel is perfectly readable and it is enjoyable and you will get hooked to it, and you are going to love this character called Tom Jones. But when it comes to the first chapter in each book, I tell them, please don't read it. That's not for you. That's for me. Okay, because each of those first chapters in the 13 books talks about one aspect of writing fiction. Okay, now think about it. Think about what Matthew Arnold was saying. He was saying that, okay, Henry Fielding uh, uh, apart, Nobody had said anything about writing fiction till it comes to E.M. Foster, as you said, in aspects of the novel. Till then, nobody had said anything about it. And his argument is, Matthew Arnold's argument is, you see, in, in, in continental Europe, you have solid critics who tell novelists what to write, how to write it. And as a result of that, France, Germany, and, uh, and Russia are able to produce great fiction, whereas Britain is not able to. So the, the process of creativity and the process of criticism or the function of criticism run parallel, as you can obviously see. Okay, so that is, that is, that is one thing. The second thing is this, when it comes to evaluation, all of you know Matthew Arnold introduced the concept of the touchstone. Now, I don't know if any of you knows where that concept of the touchstone comes from. Okay, now I'm not, I don't have time again, like I told you, but uh, the, the concept of the, the touchstone comes from a particular kind of stone, which was used in a small Greek settlement in, in Turkey, in today's Turkey, which was called Lydia. And Lydia had a, a river which flowed through it, which brought down gold from the mountains, All right? So Lydia was rich and Lydia had the king called Croesus, who is talked about by Herodotus, the, 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 the father of history. And when they made bars or chunks of gold, they had a particular stone, which they also picked up from the same river and they, and they scratched the bar of gold with the stone. And depending on the color that appeared when the, when the gold was rubbed. You could see whether it was pure gold or it was mixed with silver, which is also abundantly available, or it was mixed, it was, it was an alloy of some, of some other sort. So touchstone is something which tells, it tells you the purity of gold, or here it tells you the purity of literature. So this is what literary criticism means. Literary criticism, please understand, basically is about three things, or rather four things. One, analysis and interpretation. It's obviously that analysis, basically, not even interpretation, it's analysis. The second would be the, the second would be prescription. The third would be apologetics to defend the particular kind of writing. And the fourth would be evaluation to decide on a canon and to decide what should be studied in the university, what should be 
read by sophisticated, educated, uh, elite strata of society, and so on. So this is literary criticism. When we come across to critical theory, now I think the person will, the, 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 the school of, uh, of theory that we'll have to begin with there is with structuralism. But I'll come to structuralism in just a few more minutes. Okay, now there, we are talking about the first important person. We are talking about the first important, uh, the, the first important uh, structuralist, structuralist, and uh, that would be Ferdinand de Saussure. Now, Ferdinand de Saussure was a linguist. He had nothing to do with literature. He was a linguist. And from then on, you go on, you get, you get the next important structuralist, who would be Claude Levi Strauss. And Claude Levi Strauss was an anthropologist. And then you get Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud was a psychoanalyst. You, you get Carl Jung. Carl Jung was a psychoanalyst again. And then you get Marxist theories. Now, Marxism is an ideology. It has nothing to do with literature. All right? Now, all these are people from other domains who are coming in to analyze literature and to interpret literature. So this is what we mean by critical theory. Critic, and some of you already mentioned it to me when you answered, when you raised your hands, you answered, and you told me there's pe people from other domains who are coming into the field of literature and who are trying to interpret literature. Okay, so this has nothing to do with, so here are those, those what I might call selfish, what I might call selfish concerns like prescription, like apologetics, like evaluation will not feature. So uh, as a result of this, when it comes to critical theory, the, the, since it is from other domains, the first thing is the concept of literary is dropped. So it becomes critical theory. And as a result of that, everything in culture becomes a text. Okay, today we are living in a world of culture theory, right? And you might have seen, uh, those of you who are uh, writing your net exams, you might have seen this. You must have seen that the syllabus of JNU, which was revised very recently and which has become the syllabus for the net exam, is purely based on culture theory. Okay, when it comes to culture theory, everything is a text. Everything is a text because we have moved out of the realm of literature into other disciplines, into the discipline of anthropology, psychology, linguistics, philosophy, and so on. So uh, it opens up completely. The whole domain of literature opens up now into a fascinating array of all sorts of aspects of culture which can move in. So that is the first thing. The second thing is this. Critical theory is never, never prescriptive. Since it is outside the field of literature, no critical theorist will tell you, listen, this is the way you should write, and this is what you should write. No critical theorist will ever say that. So that's the second point. It is, it is descriptive rather than prescriptive. It is descriptive in the sense that it tries to, it tr tries to throw light from its particular domain onto literature. And please remember, the critical theorists have done a massive lot. Consider Sigmund Freud, or uh, consider Carl Jung, right? Consider somebody like Robert Graves. Now, these people have thrown a lot of light, Dr. Ernest Jones and his writing about Hamlet and so on. They have thrown a lot of light on literature, but they, the light that they're throwing is from their domains and not from the realm of literature, right? So first of all, it will not be prescriptive, it will be descriptive. The second, it will never be evaluative. It will be interpretative, okay? It will be interpretative, it will not be evaluative. You'll never get a theorist coming around and telling you, this is a good book, this is not. This is, a, this is canon, this is not, okay? And uh, people, I want you to understand this, that opens up vast avenues for us. The result is that, you know, in our third year BA English language and literature, in the sixth semester, our students have to do a project paper. It's mandatory. All of them, it is, it is a major paper in itself, a project paper uh, of 30 pages of research that they have to do under a guide. And they have to go through a external viva voce examination. 
and so on. Now, this has been of tremendous help when it comes to our students getting admission in international universities and also top univers uh, universities in India, like Jadavpur University, Hyderabad Central University, and so on. Now, there, what, what the, the interview panel tells them is simply this. We are not interested in your marks. You don't even have to show us your marks. Right? We, we are not interested in the marks that Madras Christian College gave you. You just show us your projects. You show, show us your project papers and their assessment is done on the basis of their projects. Now, the result, the result of this culture theory is that one of my students could do her project on a cigarette brand, which is meant for women. It's an American cigarette called Lucky Strike. She could do her project on advertisements for, for a cigarette. And she could go through a Viva Voce examination. And I think she's somewhere abroad right now. Okay. There was another student of mine who went to one of the fishing villages in Chennai, in OMR, in uh, the old Mahabalipuram Road in Chennai. And she went in, uh, and she went every evening out there. And for those of you who are not Tamils, uh, you may not know this. There is something called a fishing song, or rather a fisherman's song. Okay, it is called Ailasa. Okay, that because that's the rhythm that it follows, the Ailasa. So they have a they have a they have a song which they sing as they get into their catamarans and they start rowing. Okay, they sing a song. Now this girl went there, sat there. It's all it's all Tamil, of course, and she recorded that song. And she brought it back and she did, and she did her project on that. And when she did her project on that, uh, we didn't see the significance of it. I saw an interesting project. That's all I saw. But the Tamil department in MCC got very excited about it because what they told us was probably this will be the last piece of research that will be done on the Ailasa song. Because right now the catamarans are being replaced by outboard motors. Yamaha, outboard motors. So when that happens, uh, Divya Lakshmi has raised a hand. Divya Lakshmi, have you anything to tell me? I Divya? would like to add on something, sir. Yes, please, ma'am. In MCC, I'm from MCC. Okay. And during our MPhil time, we okay. went for a folklore field visit. Okay. Uh, so we had some interaction with the fisher folk okay so we were we were there to collect the folk songs fox then okay. stories okay okay that's great uh, and it was uh, our a field visit was on folk literature okay so, so you, you were working under uh, uh, professor phoebe phoebe, phoebe. phoebe. Okay. Yes, okay i understand that okay yes yeah, we were you. having an interaction with the fisher folk okay. we got we 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 got upset because nowadays they are singing the cinematic songs, yeah, not the, yeah, yeah. Not the cultural okay. Fisher, okay. Fisher thank folk. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't know, but this student of mine, thank you so much, Divya, you can put on your hands. Thank you so much for the contribution. And she, this girl actually was able to get the original Ilesa songs and the, 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 the Tamil department was excited because they said, listen, this is a part of Tamil culture that's going to vanish. It's going to go and it's never going to come back. And here's somebody who's recorded it and who's done her research on it. And probably the Tamil department has not done it. And the English department is the first department to do something like this. So this is what critical theory can do. Okay. So that is something that I want you to keep in mind. The different distinction since you, this whole uh, FBP is on critical theory. I wanted, to, I wanted you to know and I wanted you to understand the, the avenues that you have open in front of you because we have stepped out of the realm of literature into a wide open field where we can deal with almost anything in the world and we can call it literature. And I want you to understand this as well. When it comes to the Viva Voce examination, there are people from other colleges. None of them has been on a board of studies. So when they come there and they say, listen, you're talking about BA English language and literature. And here is a person who's doing a project on a Tamil song and that to Tamil oral tradition. It is not even translation. OK, so how do you justify this? I can coolly tell them, listen, our department and our syllabus works on culture theory. And therefore, everything is a text to us. 
you can talk you can take food it would be a text you could take clothes it would be a text you could take hairstyles it could be a text and right now there is a student working with under me right now and he is uh, uh, he, he is he is working on uh, uh, what do you call these things this uh, those um, uh, the, he, he, one of them is working right now on web games one of them is working on web games another is work, working on memes we, memes and the impact memes are a way of communication memes are a part of language and the impact that they've had on different aspects the 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 the, the start status of somebody politics and so on he's working on that right now but what does that have to do with literature it doesn't but when it comes under the bracket or the, under the umbrella of critical theory then everything is is open to us so i just wanted to inform you about that and i hope that this gives you some kind of a, an excitement as you go back to your colleges as you guide your your your, your research scholars and so on i hope this opens up it it makes uh, to use the right word it critical theory is known for its catholicity catholicity with a small c and the word catholicity means universality okay so it gives you, i hope this gives you a universal perspective of human existence itself and not just purely on literature so i just wanted to tell you that uh, before i enter into uh, into structuralism now you had a lecture a couple of days ago on uh, new criticism okay now uh, i am i am using terry eagleton and uh, the book that he wrote called uh, uh, by the way i i just wanted to mention a few books to you that you could share the, the pdf is available so i wish you could share these books with your students uh, when they are doing their research and these would be really helpful the the first book of course is quite obvious that's peter barry's uh, beginning theory that everybody knows okay and please peter barry's beginning theory is not a reference book for professors it's meant for students so please let your students use them you don't use them they use it okay so that is beginning theory that's an obvious book and the second book i wanted to refer to you and these are books pd these are pdfs which we share with our second year students because they start thinking about their project right from second year so that they're ready by the third year we take it very seriously so the, the, this is a pdf that we share uh, the book called a reader's guide to contemporary literary theory a reader's guide to contemporary literary theory the hard copy that i have is a third edition but the pdf that you that is available and which we share with our students is the fifth edition and it is written by ramen selden it is written by ramen selden r a m a n s e l d e n ramen selden with with peter widowson peter widowson that is p e t e r w i d d o s o n now you just have to type ramen selden and you will be able to get this book okay so that is one book i i would like you to share with your students the other is another fascinating book called practicing theory practicing theory and reading literature practicing theory and reading literature colon and introduction colon and introduction this is a companion volume to the book that i just referred to a reader's guide to contemporary literary theory it's a companion book so when it comes there here in this book in reader's guide he will give you all the critical theories and his analysis is beautiful so he will give you the theory here when it comes to the practicing theory it is purely about practicing theory okay so he will just give you the the the, the, the name of a text and he will and he will tell you what critical theory he is using he is applying on the text and he'll just go into analysis okay so there will be no explanation of the theory in the second volume okay and in the companion volume that is practicing theory and reading literature okay the the these books i refer to them because 
please understand critical theory if you ask most students of literature and i think you have been students of literature and i think you will agree with me critical theory can be the most dry as dust boring subject in the world it can be if it is going to be taken in isolation separated from practice but if you are going to give students the theory and if you're going to allow them to practice on a text they will find it exciting as i will try to show you now uh, for the organizers of this uh, of of this fdp i have a reputation for overshooting my time i'll try to conform to the time i promise you i will but i'm not sure whether i will be able to i'll do my best but having said that now uh please understand this english literature was introduced this comes from peter barry now english literature was introduced as a discipline in any of the higher education uh, the, the uh, higher education institutions in england only in 1829 it was introduced only in 1829 and considering the fact that that merton college oxford has been had been functioning from 1300 ce coming down to 1829 is a long period of time when only classics were taught english literature was not taught right and then english literature was introduced at that point of time just as a just as a, a method of teaching english grammar okay so basically that was part to english basically that was part to english but then again you can go back to beginning theory and read this up uh, he talks about how liberal humanism became a prominent a prominent area, uh, area of study for 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 students of universities because of the department of english and the first head of the department of english in kings college in london in kings college in london that's where li liberal humanism came and liberal liberal humanism came became a kind of a replacement it became a kind of replacement for religion okay and this is the tone that would be taken in by by matthew arnold in his essay called the a study of poetry where he says that uh, just like he talks about in his uh, in his poem called dover beach he says that uh, with the attacks of darwinism and uh, and prehistory and so on that the fabric of religion is slipping all right and something has to take its place it science had not come into its place as as much as it has today so Matt, matthew arnold argues that poetry has to take over from religion okay and the same thing was argued by the head of the first head of the department in kings college where he says literature has to take the place of religion okay now please understand the the the, the reason why english literature was introduced was first of all like i said for something like part to english to teach grammar but more importantly it was because the government began to realize that, that there was a large reading public out there that was one thing secondly uh, cheap paper was available so books were accessible and particularly the periodicals Uh, like the writings of Arthur Conan Doyle or of Charles Dickens were available, and people started accessing these things and reading reading them, and they were being influenced by them. Now, any government, starting from Queen Elizabeth the first, right? Any any government would be seriously worried about that, because what is going to these these books and what people are consuming from those books can cause political and social instability. so they needed a kind of a censor team in the places of higher education who could tell the students what to read what not to read what to keep in the market and what what to keep out of the market what to encourage and what to discourage and so on now that was that became the purpose of literary criticism and when it came to the turn of the century when it came to the turn of the century there was no proper critical paraphernalia to analyze any of the text that is the reason why the professors of english in these universities and please remember the the uh, oxford university started started english literature only in the 20th century okay till then there was no department of english in oxford university or in cambridge university they started very late right so at the turn of the century there was no proper paraphernalia 
there, were no, there was no proper terminology. There, were, there was no proper theory or criticism to apply on critical texts. That is the reason why people fell back on interpreting texts on three foundations. One, history, the historical background out of which the text came, and that formulates one of the foundations of all critical theories, and that is that no text exists in a vacuum. No text exists in a vacuum. It is a product of three, three principles. One, it is the product of its historical milieu. It is a product of its historical milieu, the period out of which it came. Now, that need not mean that need not mean that it has to be a historical novel like A Tale of Two Cities. It need not be that. Okay, so uh, when you take something as far away as uh, Jara Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, now when you take some, something like that, now Tolkien had gone through the First World War, the war which they said was the war to end all wars. And then the Second World War, he sent his son Christopher Tolkien to the war. Again, the war that they promised was going to be the end of all wars. And then we enter into the nuclear age. Okay, and with that historical background, Tolkien wrote The Lord of the Rings. Is the ring the nuclear bomb or not? Tolkien blindly said no. He said it's not. But then there are a lot of critics today who argue that the nuclear bomb is the ring. Okay, but whatever it may be. Now, what I'm talking about is the historical background out of which a text rises. So that's point number one. Two, the social context. When I say social, I mean socio-economical. The socio-economical context out of which the text rises. Okay, note, I told you the text rises, not the author rises. And that's a complication we'll have to take up with structuralism. Okay, so that is the second thing. And the third, the personality of the writer, which is something, again, we'll take up with structuralism. Okay, so these were the three aspects of criticism that were employed in, uh, in the universities at this particular time. And they would have already told you this, any, any school of criticism is a response to the school that goes before. Okay, so new criticism, a close reading of the text, intrinsic criticism, and so on, were a response to a form of analysis of a text or an interpretation of a text, which was moving away from the text into history, sociology, economics, and biography. So leave all that alone, cut the world out, come to the text. That's what new criticism was trying to say. Okay, and Terry Eagleton in his, in his book called uh, uh, Critical Theory and Introduction, in his chapter on, uh, in his chapter on, uh, on structuralism, says this, that's the second chapter, in fact, and this is what he says. Now, the new critics had evolved. They, they did a good job. They did a good job, but then Terry Eagleton is a Marxist critic, and therefore he leans more on, on Marxist ideology. So he says they were... They were good enough. The new critics were good enough in, in taking literature away from the domination of industrial industrialization and from science. Okay, so that is what he argues. But then after the Second World War, when science had become enrooted, when it had become enrooted and there was no way, just like today, a world without science is something that we can't imagine. Now, literature now needed a more robust, a more, a more comprehensive critical theory that it could use to analyze. And there, two people step in. Okay, or rather, two, two, two schools step in. One was the archetypal theory as it was propounded by Northrop Fry, and the second was the structuralists. Okay, now I've got to place in a disclaimer here. I've got to place in a disclaimer here before I go into structuralism, and that would be this. You now, I was talking to a senior professor of English, and she asked me, uh, what is your area of interest? And uh, Nam has already told you what my, sorry, what my areas of interest are. And uh, I said, uh, narratology as a spin-off of uh, structuralism. And she said, oh, structuralism, that's terribly outdated. Now, I want to tell you one thing today. Structuralism is not outdated. Structuralism can never be outdated as long as there are human beings. Okay, because the human 
mind works in structures. Okay, and in academics itself, like I told you, a spin-off of, uh, of structuralism is narratology. And narratology is in the forefront of research today. It is right in the forefront of research today. And, uh, and today there, there, there are scholars who are arguing, listen, we better take narratology out of the Department of English or other, out of the Department of Literature. And we better distribute it to all other domains, all other disciplines, because narratologists like me believe that human beings are communicative beings, yes. Okay, one of the specializations as structuralism and Ferdinand de Saussure and the others will argue is that structure that, that human beings are communicative beings and their way of communication is language. So that's one vital, vital thing which differenti differentiates us from other animals. But there is another thing as well and that's an extension of this aspect of communication and language. Communication basically in the form of language which is employed by human beings. Right? Now, as an extension of that, uh, narratologists will tell you that human beings are also narrative beings. They're also narrative beings. They can't stop being narrative. They can't exist without narratives. And uh, this, be this becomes a point of contention in my department because uh, there is a, there's a poetry paper that we have. And there's one particular poetry paper which is entirely about lyric poetry and another is entirely about narrative poetry. And I go in there and I tell the students, uh, you know something, there's really nothing called narrative poetry, uh, sorry, lyric poetry. There's nothing called lyric poetry. So what I tell them is see, take the classic poem that you read so many times in your school, Daffodils, Daffodils by William Wordsworth. And you take the first line, I wandered lonely as a cloud. That's supposed to be a classic lyric poem, right? But you take that first line, I wandered uh, lonely as a cloud. That is narration. That is narration. Now, narratology today has taken all kinds of implications. So uh, if everything is narrative, today what people are arguing is this, and I'm not talking about literary theorists. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not talk talking even about critical theorists. I'm talking about experts in other fields. Feels like, for instance, instance advertising. Every advertisement is a narrative. So unless you are able to narrate properly, you are not going to market your product. So that's one thing. Uh, take a uh, take a law court, right? The a case winning or losing is going to depend entirely on how the case is presented and how the event is represented by the lawyer concerned. That that is what winning or losing the case is going to mean so what and take take a person who's uh, take a person from the microbiology department my neighbor department in mcc now take a person from microbiology department who's writing an article to to the journal the greatest uh, science journal in the world nature okay and he or she writes the article now the writing of the article is completely narrative and whether he or she is able to narrate properly his or her discoveries in the laboratory is going to mean whether that article is going to get published or not. So we are talking about different languages in different domains for narratology. All this comes back to structuralism. So structuralism, structuralism being outdated, I don't think so. I don't think so at all. Now, let me very quickly move into uh, structuralism per se. Now, we have to go back to the year 1725. Okay, uh, by the way, the, the secondary source that I'm using for this, this particular talk is by Terence Hawkes. That's T-E-R-E-N-C-E, -E, Terence Hawkes, H-A-W-K-E-S, Terence Hawkes. And uh, the name of the book is Structuralism and Semiotics. And this is considered to be a seminal book on structuralism as well as semiotics. Okay, so that is the book that I'll be using. And please, I'm not going to cover the whole book. I can't be comprehensive. I have, as it is, 27 minutes left. But uh, definitely, I'm not going to be able to finish in 27 minutes. So please pardon me. We have to go back to the date 1725, when a distinguished Italian jurist, uh, uh, that's a, a judge, basically, 
called B Gem Batista Vico. Now, I'm, I'm, you don't have to bother about the first name. The second name is Vico. I don't come up with PowerPoint presentations because I believe that PowerPoint presentations are distractions. So I don't do that. That's the reason why I'm not screen, screen sharing right now. Uh, the name of the person is Vico, V-I-C-O. You can go online, Google search, and you'll find the book that he wrote called Neobo Scientia, or in English translation, that is the new science, the new science. And in the new science, what Biko tries to do is ra something rather ambitious. And what he tries to do is this. He takes Galileo, Bacon, Newton as his model. And he wants to come up with a, a, what do you call it, a framework for what he calls the world of nations, for what he calls the world of nations, and, uh, and achieve what Galileo and Bacon and uh, Newton had done for the world of nature. They were trying to come up with a, 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 what I might call a scientific grammar for the functioning of this universe. Consider the laws of th thermodynamics or the laws of gravity and so on, or the, the heliocentric universe and so on. Right now, what he was trying to do was in the new science, he was trying to come up with a metaphysical paradigm for the world of nations, where they had done it for the world of nature. He was doing it for the world of nations. And Biko, let me go very quickly here. Now, Biko's argument basically is this that primitive man, as we call him, or primitive humans, as we call them, are not, as we think, barbaric. They are not savage, like we generally tend to think of them. Right? He believed that their perception of this world, and this is very current, please, their perception of this world was on a very systematic, on a very systematic structural format. Okay, because they were in, in, endued, according to him, with something which is called sapienza poetica. Okay, don't bother about that. The translation of that is simply poetic wisdom. It simply means poetic wisdom. That they were able to convert all their experiences, all their experiences. They were able to convert all the experiences, whether it's social experience or personal experience. They were able to convert all of that into a number of factors. One of that is myth. One of that is myth. The second is metaphor. And the third is symbolism. They were able to do that. They were able to convert all the experience into myth, metaphor, or symbolism. Okay, this becomes the kind of metaphysic, if you want, the metaphysics of existence itself. All right, so what Biko argues is this, myths properly interpreted can be seen as civil histories of the first people who everywhere were naturally poets. Okay, now what he argues is this, listen, the myth, the so-called ridiculous-looking creation myths of the of the Indians, of the indigenous people of Papua New Guinea, or of South America, or the San people of South of South Africa. Now, the ridiculous-sounding creation stories and so on that you hear are not to be taken for real. They are the experiences of the people which have been encoded, which have been encoded with metaphor, symbol, and myth, okay? And this is what he says. Th this, discovery, th th this discovery achieved only with greatest difficulties because of us, because with our civilized nature, we moderns cannot imagine and can understand only with great toil the poetic nature of these first men, okay? What has happened, according to Biko, is Two important things. One started with the Renaissance. One started with the Renaissance. Uh, okay, I should actually say three important things. One was the in, uh, was the influence of Christianity. The influence of Christianity. Scholars like Tolkien and others have literally banged their heads on the wall, saying, "With the advent of Christianity, 
the mythical oral traditions just vanished. Okay, so that is one point. Second, with the Renaissance and the introduction of reason, the introduction of reason and throwing away all these myths and, and metaphors and symbols and so on as pure superstition, a waste of time, childishness, and so on. So that was the second thing, Renaissance rationality, and the third, industrialization. With these, what has happened is we have lost the key to the code of the ancients, the key to the code of what we may call the wisdom of the ancients. This is essentially what has happened. Okay, but Biko goes on, he goes further on. And what he says is this, he establishes the, uh, the principle called verum factum. I'll explain that. Verum factum, verum means true. What is true? What humans recognize as true. Okay. And at the same time, factum, he creates. He creates what is true in the sense that he experiences something and he superimposes his personality. He superimposes his, his, the shape of his mind, as Vico calls it. He superimposes the shape of his mind on to what he experiences. And the result is humans, as they go through life, are creating the world around them. I hope you can understand that. Humans, as we, as we go through life, we are creating the world around us. Let me give you a very simple example. Okay, now I'm, I walk down Madras Christian College right down right now. Of course, there's a lockdown and stu students aren't here. And I walk down the road in MCC and I see a person in front of me. It could be a student, it could be, it could be a professor, it could be a support staff, it could be anybody. I see a person in front of me. Now, that person that I see in front of me is that person as I see that person. So depending on my sense of values, on whether I, what my aspect of beauty is, my aspect of what the, what the correct height should be, what the correct complexion should be, I create a being in front of me. I hope that is understood. So what I have done basically is I have structured the world around me. I've structured that person according to my personality. Now, verum factum means this, that what a person recognizes as true as sees in front of him and the, the, the superimposition of my personality on what I see in front of me are the same. So what I see is what I want to see. In other words, what are we talking about? Prof. Uh, Dr. Matangi, when she was introducing the subject, was talking about essence. Nothing that we have around us, that we see around us, has an essence. It is something that has been created by us individuals as we perceive the world around us. Okay, that's point number one. Two, what Biko argues here basically is this, that there is a process of structuring which is going on. We structure the world around us as we go along. And in that sense, in that sense, all of us are structuralists. We are creating structures around us all the time, nonstop, from the moment we are born till the moment we die, from the moment we wake up till the moment we go to sleep. We are structuring the world around us using our personalities. Okay? So in other words, what Terence Hawkes argues is true. He says, human beings are fundamentally extension. We are communicative beings. We are narrative beings. We are structuralist beings. Beings which create structure. Now, if that is going to be the case, now we've got to understand, we've got to analyze what this thing called structure is. What is this thing called structure? And I still remember uh, sitting in a lecture by, given by Dr. Noel Irudiraj, the then head of the Department of English in the Bharati Dasan University. And I still remember the title of the, the lecture was, the topic of the lecture was structuralism and, uh, and formalism. And it was a good lecture, but it went flying over the heads of most people. 
And I still remember at the end of the lecture, towards the end of the lecture, there was a senior professor who was sitting next to me. And he turned to me and said, with anguish in his eyes, literally, he turned to me and said, but structure, what is structure? Okay, now, if we want to start studying structuralism, we better try to define structure. Okay, and here we have to fall back on one critic, one theorist, his name is Jean Piaget. Jean Piaget, that is J-E-A-N-P-I-A-G-E-T. Jean Piaget, P-I-A-G-E-T. The name of the book that he wrote is simply Structuralism. The name of the book that he wrote is simply Structuralism. Okay, now this is the definition that he gives. So maybe some of you may want to write this down. So I'll go a little slow on this. Structure, he argues, structure, he argues, can be observed. Structure, he argues, can be observed in an arrangement of entities. In an arrangement of entities which embodies which embodies the following fundamental ideas. The following fundamental ideas. Yes, uh, Lisa, somebody has raised her hand. Was it a gentleman? Was it a gentleman? Somebody has raised their hand. Did somebody raise their hand? No, I'll continue. Okay. So I'll, I'll repeat that. Structure can be observed in an arrangement of entities which embodies the following fundamental ideas. First, the idea of wholeness. The idea of wholeness, this W-H-O-L-E-N-E-S-S. -E -E -S. The idea of wholeness. Second, the idea of transformation. The idea of transformation. Third, the idea of self-regulation. First, the idea of wholeness. Second, the idea of transformation. Third, the idea of self-regulation. Okay, now, let me quickly try to explain this. Right Now, what is a structure? Now, anything in the world can be a structure. Anything which is compound and which has entities or parts within it or parts within it can be called a structure. So, for instance, English as a language is a structure. English as a language is a structure. If I'm going to take that social phenomenon or cultural phenomenon, which is called clothing, that would be a structure. Okay? The different entities in there, shirt, pant, shoes, socks, tie, coat, and so on. All these would be the entities within the structure. Okay, I hope that is, that is understandable. I hope that's comprehensible. Okay, so this is what structure means. So anything in the world can be structured. Food is a structure. Right? It's marriage ceremonies can be a structure. Now, you notice one thing. The structure that we are talking about is generally an abstraction. The structure that we're talking about is generally an abstraction. When I say food, that is an abstraction. Okay. When it comes to the entities, then it will become the realization of the structure. It will become a realization of the structure, the physical, tangible realization of the structure. So let me quickly run through these three parameters. The idea of wholeness, the idea of transformation, and the idea of self-regulation. Now, we, when we talk about wholeness, we are talking about what, uh, what Terence Hawkes calls internal coherence. We are talking about internal coherence. Okay? Now, what that means is this. I talked about the different, I, I talked about the different entities or the different components that are found within the structure. Now, each of those, each of those will have, each of those cannot have an independent existence. Okay, none of those can have an independent existence or an independent meaning. 
they are relational. So each entity will be in relation to something else. Okay. So for instance, you are having biryani is one thing. Okay. And then you're having payasam with it or you're having curd rice with it. Now, biryani per se doesn't have a significance. It has to have its significance from the, from, from the curd rice that goes with it. Okay. So a structure is not just different pieces thrown together where each has its own characteristic, its own significance, its own relevance, and so on. All the entities there are mutually dependent on others within that structure. Okay, each of those are dependent within that structure. And they cannot have meaning outside the structure. Okay, they cannot have meaning outside the structure. I'll come to that in just a moment. Let's take the second idea. Structure is non-static. That is, it's transformational. It's dynamic. It's dynamic. Any structure is dynamic. So you take the structure called English, right? Now, if you're going to take the structure called English, now there was a, a time in the 1960s when a computer was bigger than this building. It was called a supercomputer. All right. And then as time goes on, probably in the 1980s, that supercomputer was reduced and it came and sat on the table. Okay. When you did, when that happened, this structure called language had to, had uh, called English, had to respond to that, had to give it a, a specificity. And what it gave it was desktop. And from then on, you see, the structure has expanded, it's moved. From supercomputer, it's moved into creating another entity, okay, which is the desktop. And then from there, the desk, the, the, from the desk, the computer moves to the lap. So when that happens, you've got to give it another name. You've got to give it another identity. You can't call it desktop anymore because it's sitting on your lap. So you call it a laptop. So the structure is never static. It is always going through changes. It is always going through, through transformation. And uh, this is what is meant in TG grammar of Noam Chomsky. This is what is known in, as TG grammar by Noam Chomsky, where you have one small structure, okay? Subject, verb, object, simplest morphemic structure uh, that we can get in the English language. Okay, now you get something like that. Subject, verb, object, SVO. Now you got that format, Using that format, you can create any number of millions of new structures, of, of new entities. Now, that's, that's not a structure. That's a new entity. And I'll come to that in just a moment. Okay, this is what results in Noam Chomsky's transformational generative grammar, TG grammar. Okay, the third, it's self-regulating. Okay, now I told you the structure goes through changes within it as it encounters new stimuli, all right? But it will take, it will make its transformations within itself and never appeal outside. It will never appeal outside. In other words, the, 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 the world of the structure has laws which are intrinsic to it, okay? <coughs> I'm sorry. The world as a, of, of the structure has laws which are intrinsic to it, which will not apply to other structures, which will not apply to other structures. Sorry. No, I'll just give you an example. I'll just give you an example. Uh, now, supposing the I know the cricket test matches are going on between India and South Africa. Now, supposing I stood in a cricket pitch. And if I raise my finger like this, I hope you can see them. Okay, see my finger. Now, if I raise my finger like this, all of you know it takes too much time to get you to interact with me. So I'm, I'll just I'll just say it, say it. Now, when I say if, if as an umpire I raise my finger like this, it means that a person is out. But at the same time, if I'm going to raise two fingers like this, it means six. 
Okay, this is within cricket. This is within cricket, and there, this, this has changed to this, or this has changed to this, and it has mean, it has meaning, it has significance within the laws that govern cricket. And both the spectators watching cricket as well as the players playing cricket know what those rules are. Know the grammar, if you want. Know the grammar of cricket and they understand what each of those means. But if I were to enter into a football ground and if I were to stand there and raise my finger in the same way, it would have absolutely no meaning. Okay. And uh, the other example that I love to give is this. Uh, I'm sorry, it may sound a little perverse, but this is an example which I think reaches home. Now, when it comes to traffic regulations, you get that thing that goes on, the red color light that goes on. And when the red color light goes on, it, it within the rules, within the parameters of traffic rules, it means stop. But if you're going to take it out of that structure, and if you're going to take it into another structure, and if you are going to take it into the world of prostitution, and you talk about the red light areas in Mumbai, and so on. Now, there, it's, the structure has shifted completely. Right? Now, there, a red light will not mean stop. It will mean come. This is how structures can change. I'm sorry, this is how the Samims or the entities can change when they move from one structure out of, out of their context. Okay, so that is point number one. Okay, second, within this thing called self-regulation, right, the, the, the structures operate with laws which are self-sufficient, with rules which are self-sufficient. Okay, now please understand, uh, Yes, Dr. Sendel. Dr. Sendel, somebody raised your hand. No, okay. Uh, now, please understand what I what I mean is this: the now this is where we move into another area, which is called the signifier and the signified. Okay, the signifier and the signified. This is pure linguistics. Okay, and we are talking about seizure here. But I'll come to that in just a second. Now, please get this clear. I'll, 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 I'll take up seizure and I'll try to explain that to you. Okay. Now, the word dog, the word dog within the structure called English, within the structure called English is a phonetic sound. As I say it right now, dog, it is a, it is a phonetic structure. It's a phoneme. It's a phonetic structure, and it has no reference at all to a four-legged animal. It has no reference at all to a four-legged animal for the simple reason that if I want to talk about a four-legged animal, animal, I'm leaving the world of language I'm, or the structure called language, and I'm entering into the structure called zoology. <coughs> okay, so within the structure called language, there is only a phoneme, and that is dog. And for people who understand, who, who work within the structure called the English language, it has a certain signification. And it refers certainly not to a zoological creature called the dog. Okay, I hope you can get that. Now, let's move on very quickly to the founder, if you want, of uh, structuralism. And that was Ferdinand B. Sajur. That is S-A-U-S-S-U-R-E. Most of you know him, so I don't have to say anything here. And let me quickly move on. Right. Now, remember, remember what we saw about Giam Battista Vico. And we said that no, nothing has an essence in itself. Nothing has an essence in itself. Okay, it is only as we create it as we go on, as we perceive it, as we experience it. Now, Sejor expands that further. He extends that further. Right? And what he says is he is a linguist. So when he came into linguistics, when he entered in, into linguistics, before he introduced this concept of structuralism, now, when he entered into the field of linguistics, what he realized was basically this, that each word 
was supposed to have a clear and definite meaning, just as we have it in the dictionary. Okay, each word was to have a clear and definite meaning with a historical dimension. With a historical dimension. So I'll just give you a quick example. There's an example that I usually give. And the example is this. Now, the word, the word naughty, N-A-U-G-H-T-Y, naughty. Now, the word naughty, if you're going to look at the dictionary, probably the dictionary meaning for it, I've not checked it, but the dictionary meaning for it will most probably be mischievous. Okay, now the word mischievous as you have it, can it be applied to a person like me? No, you, it can't. It usually applies to small kids, right? But at the same time, if you're going to go back to Shakespearean times, in Shakespeare's language, the word naughty would most probably have meant lazy fellow. The root of the word being not, a person who does nothing, naughty fellow. Now, can that be applied to me? It can. Okay, in Samuel Johnson, the, the same word naughty changes meaning and it becomes, it becomes a good for nothing fellow. Again, the word not. Okay, but definite meanings are there. Okay, lazy fellow, good for nothing fellow, not uh, mischievous fellow, definite meanings are there. Now, this is called the diachronic study of language. This is called the diachronic study of language. Okay, now what Sejour did, Ferdinand de Sejour, what he did was this. He introduced a re relational, a, a re relational study of language rather than the substantive study of language. Okay, in other words, what he argued was this, that each entity, as we saw, each entity within a grammatical framework, that is different words, different sounds, have to be studied, studied in relation with other sounds within that sentence, rather than study it historically. Okay, so language invents itself as it goes along, just like Biko was talking about life itself. Okay, language invents itself as it goes along. Okay, and uh, the language is a closed, self-sufficient system. It need not talk about the past. It need not talk about the present. Okay, language, according to Sejour, is a total system, a total system complete at every given moment. <coughs> complete at every given moment. Okay, now the other two terms, I think most of you will be familiar with them. The, the terms like Lang and Parole were introduced by Sejour. And what Sejour argues there is primarily this. Okay, what, what Sejour argues there is primarily this. Lang is your knowledge of a particular language. It is the structure itself. It is the structure itself. So your knowledge of English, your knowledge of English and your vocabulary, your vocabulary probably is about 5,000 words in the English language. That is the average person's uh, knowledge of English, at least professor of English. Okay, so that is, and that is there. It's an abstraction. It's an abstraction. It is there. Your knowledge of grammatical structures as well as syntax, as uh, words is there. It's an abstraction. It's there in your head somewhere. Okay, so that is the line. But then when you start communicating either graphically or phonetically, okay, phonetically like I'm doing now or graphically as maybe some of you are taking down notes. Now, when you do that, what I'm doing as I speak is out of my line, out of that abstraction called English that is there in my head, I pull out individual items and I string them together to form a sentence which I speak to you. That is what he calls parole. That, he, that is what he calls parole, P-A-R-O-L-E, parole. So there is this vast expanse of, expanse of, gram, uh, of grammatical and phonemic expressions within my head, out of which I pull out these few and lay them together to form a cohesive sentence that I'm speaking to you right now. This is the difference between Lang and Parole. 
Okay. Now, this could be expanded. He, Sisho was working only within language. He was a linguist and he was working only within language. Okay. And he came up with another important discovery. Now, uh, people, please understand this. Now, this is what was expanded by Noam Chomsky when he was talking about competence and performance. Competence is the knowledge that you have of a particular language, its different words and syntax, as well as the grammatical structures that you know. The more complex, the more, the, the, more, the, the wider and the larger your structure is going to be. Okay? Right? And he called your performance, the, your use, your everyday use, either in writing or in speaking, a language uh, performance. So your knowledge of the subject is competence. Your performance of the language is, yeah, sorry, your use of the language is performance. Okay. Now, I'd like to take this into another field as well. And that is into Carl Jung's uh, archetypal theory. Okay. Archetypes are those. Are, are that mass of myths and all sorts of things which are there. All right. Now, when telling a story, when writing a story or creating a myth or whatever it may be, you pull out elements that is a collective unconscious, the collective unconscious of the whole planet Earth, of the whole, of, of the whole human race. That's the collective unconscious. That is the archetype which is there. Now, what you do when you're telling a story, Okay, now this is what uh, uh, Joseph Campbell will argue in the book called uh, uh, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Right Now, when you're telling a story from that mass of, of collective unconscious that you have, of, of images that you have, you pull out individual images and you string them together to create a plot. And that is called archetypal images. Those are called archetypal images, and Jung goes to very large, ex uh, very, very large detail uh, and effort to explain the difference between archetype, archetype, and archetypal image. He says these are two different things completely. The difference is basically structure and the entities or semimes that go within. It is, it is lang and it is parole. It is competence and it is performance. It is archetype and archetypal image. That is how it functions. Now, Sesho went on to say one more thing, and that was this. Uh, Sesho went on to say that the signifier, okay, that is the word that I speak, has nothing to do with what I intend or, or the object concerning which I'm talking about. Okay, the example that I gave you was the word dog. Dog is a phonetic item. It's a phoneme, it's a phonetic item. It is not a zoological creature. All right, and as a result of that, the understanding of that word dog comes only as an understanding, a sociological, linguistic understanding between you and me as speakers of the English language, knowing the structure, knowing the structure and by a common consent, agreeing that the, <clears throat> that the word dog, the, the sound dog, as I say, it, will refer to something. And it is not a biological entity which is running around MCC campus right now. Okay, so the signifier is not the signified. The signifier is not the signified. Now, the next important person to talk about here and People, there are so many, so so much. There's so much I can talk about. It's already past time. So, uh, Dr. Dr. Matangi, ma'am, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'll be able to do the demo. Or, uh, ma'am, can you unmute? Is it okay if I take another five minutes or so to summarize this quickly? Yes, sir. Please. And then, and then I can go in for uh, the poem. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Will that be okay? Because in that case, it will go okay, on to about sir. seven. <laughs> it's okay, sir. You can continue, sir. It's okay. And if the participants aren't uh, bugged enough already. Sir, <laughs> they are not, so you can continue, sir. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Okay. The next, uh, the next important person that, uh, we, th that, that uh, we have to refer to is Claude Levi-Strauss. Claude Levi-Strauss was an anthropologist. Again, nothing to do with literature. 
and he found the system of structuralism. Now, I want you to understand here, I talked about the structure, okay, that overarching thing called the English language, okay, now that is the structure. And I talked about either spoken sentences and words or written sent uh, sentences and words. Now, inside the structure, these entities, entities are called semimes. S-E-M-E-M-E-S, -E 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 semimes. Okay, just like you get phonemes. Just like you get phonemes or you get morphemes. Morpheme is the smallest grammatical unit. So if you're going to use a word, a word like called, C-A-L-L-E-D, that E-D is the smallest grammatical unit and that would become a morpheme. Okay, now semim is the smallest structuralist unit. And what structuralism tries to do basically is just this, check the interplay, check the interplay of the semims with each other. No semim can have a meaning in itself. No semim can have a meaning it's in itself. Okay, and that goes for life itself. Okay, that is the reason. That is the reason why Terence Hawkes calls structuralism a way of looking at the world. Okay, other writers have not dared to come up with a, a brief uh, definition of uh, of structuralism. In fact, defining structure itself becomes so difficult. But what Terence Hawkes says is that uh, that that structuralism is a way of looking at the world. So the way it works is basically this: I enter into a classroom. And there is this girl called Shreya sitting there. The minute I look at Shreya, I know that Shreya is Shreya simply because I know that she is not Shruti. I, and I know that she is that, 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 that she is not Balaji. I know that immediately. So that is the way I identify. We identify people not by their senses, but in their relationship, uh, relation to somebody, something else. In the same way, the Samims will work. The semims will also work in relation to the other semims within the structure that you have. So each word in the sentence in relation to the other sentences with whom there is an interplay, with whom there is an interplay. That was Sejo's idea. Now, Claude Levi-Strauss took this formula that Sejo had introduced and applied that to anthropologist, uh, uh, sorry, anthropology. He applied that to anthropology and here from the world of linguistics, structuralism just widens out. It simply widens out. And when it widens out, what, what you get is this, every aspect of culture. In fact, uh, Claude Levi-Strauss was the one who introduced that aspect of uh, anthropology, which is called structural anthropology, based on the same format that, that uh, Sergio had introduced. So you take a, you take a structure like marriage. Okay, you take a structure like marriage. Now his idea is this: the structure called marriage cannot be understood if you're going to look at it simply as marriage, marriage as among the Ayers, marriage among the Ayengars. You you cannot understand it that way. The only way you can understand because within that you get the semims. And the only way you can understand it is, how is the Iyer wedding different from the Ayangari wedding? I'm sorry, that's just an example I'm giving you. Okay, how, uh, how, how are these different? The, how, how does the interplay happen here? Okay, so that is the only way we can understand it. Okay, that is Claude Levi-Strauss. And that applies to everything from food, to clothing, to everything. That is the reason why one of my students was able to do her project on a Tamil short film. Now, those of you who are not Tamils, in, uh, in certain parts of Tamil Nadu, we have a puberty rights right for girls, okay, which is called Manjal Neera Tuvila. Okay, now, the translation of that would be literally a bath in turmeric. Okay, literally, translation is a bath in turmeric. Now, a girl who reaches puberty is given a bath in turmeric and she has to go through certain rituals and she is given certain food to eat, certain kinds of food to eat. 
Now, one of my students took a short film called uh, Manjal, which is a Tamil short film on a girl going through this puberty rites and she has, she's given all these foods to eat and all that kind of thing. And she's wondering what, what in the world is going on. Right? Now, my student studied this. She did not study the history of the, of, of the ritual. She did not study when did it start and all that kind of thing. That was not what she was interested in. She was interested in just these semims, the kind of the black gram, the turmeric that is used, and all these, and the interaction that they have between them. And she went and sat with, with a Siddha doctor and an Ayurvedic doctor and said, how did these things fit into the structure that is the puberty right in this particular area? Right? And you want to expand that, you will have to take that out of the Tamil culture and you'll have to take it into other, other pu 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 puberty rights as well. So Ferdinand de Sessio uh, introduced structuralism and Claude levi Strauss takes it further on. And this is the way structuralism basically works, looking at the interaction between entities. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there is a whole lot that I've not covered. For instance, I've not touched Jonathan Kaller. I was hoping to come into him, but I've not had the time. Right? I, I wanted to do Roman Jakobson. I've not been able to do him either. And uh, my suggestion for, for, for future reading for you would uh, be the Russian formalist critics, Mikhail Bakhtin and others, and also, uh, uh, and also an understanding of, uh, of narratology. All right? I hope I've given some kind of an idea uh, I, I know this has been a very diffusive kind of a, of a talk, but I hope I've given you some kind of an idea of what structuralism basically is. Of, at least I wanted to explain to you what structure is and how structure functions. All right, and the different elements within and how I hope this will help you when it comes to your, your research. Now, I very quickly like to apply this to a poem and uh, let's hope that that... Uh, that will clarify things on how this works. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand this. This is something that I have actually done in class and that in a part two English class, not in a major class. In a part two English class, without telling the students that this is structuralism, I was using the structuralist analysis. And uh, 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 Dr. Madhangi was talking about uh, Dr. Bennett. Dr. Bennett happened to be in one of my lectures listening to, uh, listening to me doing the structural analysis. And he said, I fully endorse your view okay, on the structural ana analysis that you've done of piano. Now, the reason why I'm doing this is you get any number of instances of the application of deconstruction, uh, of, uh, of post-structuralism and so on. But very, very rarely do you get an application of structuralism per se. So that's what I'm trying to do. Now, let me quickly read through this poem for you. Okay, softly in the dark, a woman is singing to me, taking me down the vista of years till I see a child under the piano and in the boom of the tingling strings and pressing the small, uh, yeah, in the boom of the tingling strings and pressing the small poised feet of a mother who smiles as she sings. In spite of myself, the insidious mastery of song betrays me back till the heart of me weeps to belong to the old Sunday evenings at home with winter outside and hymns in the cozy parlor, the tinkling piano our guide. So now it is, for vain, it is vain for the singer to burst into clamor with the great black piano appassionato. The glamour of childish days is upon, upon me my manhood is cast down in the flood of remembrance. I weep like a child for the past. Okay, now let's try to, to make a kind of a, structural and a structuralist analysis of this poem. Okay, now the structure that we're looking at here, as far as I can see, is a structure called time. Okay, I told you that is an abstract thing. The structure is usually abstract. So here we have an abstract structure called time. Now, I have to admit one thing here. Peter Barry and others would have said this, that this poem itself is a semim or a sign. Okay, semims are also called signs. And the study of semims or signs is called semiotics. 
Okay. Now, Peter Barry would have said that this poem itself is a sign. Okay. Within the structure called poetry, particularly English poetry, and this poem would have would have to be taken in comparison with other poems in the English language. Now, I'm not. I'm going to let that pass. I'm going to let that pass, and I'm going to go into this poem, poem, and I'm going to look at the structure that we have here. The structure is time. Okay. Now, once we have that structure called time, we are talking about two two time time frames basically: time past and time present. Time past and time present. Now, let's quickly go through this poem. Softly in the dusk, a woman is singing to me. Now, this is what I told my students to do. Right? I told them, check on the tense and tell me whether this is time past or time present. So, softly in the dusk, a woman is singing to me. The tense is clear. So, we are talking about the present. right? And then, taking me back down the vista of years till I see. Okay, so taking me back down the vista of years. Now, that is a transitional line. That is a transitional line. It is neither in time present nor in time past. It is a transitional line which takes the poet from the, fr fr from, from the now to the past. And the semims that we are talking about, the signs that we are talking about are basically two. We are talking about one, the woman of the past. The woman of the past and the woman of the present, probably his girlfriend, probably his wife, but whoever it is, that is the woman of the present and the woman of the past is the mother. So this is a set of semims and the other will be the music, the music of the past and the music of the present. right? And as an interlocutor between these two, as a catalyst between these two, you will get the instrument, which is the piano. Okay, so taking me back down the vista of years. Now, that's a transitional line. It's neither here nor there. It's not neither present nor past. But till I see, when you say till I see, he is back into the future. The time has shifted from time present to time past. Till I see a child sitting under the piano in the boom of the tingling, of, of, of the tingling strings and pressing the small poised feet of a, of a mother who smiles as she sings. Okay, now there are a number of things that I want you to note here. One is a child sitting under the piano. Okay, as a grown up man, you can't sit uh, in, the in the boom of a piano. You know what, the, the keyboard that juts out of the piano. You can't sit inside there, that's not possible. So you're talking about a time of innocence of the past, when as a child, you could fit into that place and you could press the small poised feet of a mother. Now, I know this has been given a lot of psychoanalytic Freudian interpretations and so on, but I'd rather not go there. And pressing the small poised feet of a mother who smiles as she sings. So when I had my students with me, I used to tell them, underline that. Underline that, now you get tingling strings there and you get smiles as she sings. Okay. And then the next line. In spite of myself, the insidious mastery of song, we are still, no, no here we are back to the present. In, in spite of my, myself, the insidious mastery of song, so we are back to the present, right? Betrays me back, okay? So the music, it is not the woman. It is the music which betrays me and sends me back, okay? So betrays me back again, Betrays me back again, we are in, betrays me back again, we are in transition, going back to the past. Okay, in spite of myself, the insidious mastery of song betrays me back. And please remember, what betrays him back is not the woman, it is the song. Okay, betrays me back till the heart of me weeps to belong. He's still in the present. Till the heart of me weeps to belong to the old Sunday evening. So, back to the past from time present to time past, okay? Till the heart of me weeps to belong to the old Sunday evenings at home. So back to the past with winter outside, okay? Winter outside. Now, there's again, there, there is this interesting play of Samim's there. Winter outside, absolute coldness. Now, <coughs> Claude Levi-Strauss talk, talked about binary opposition. He said, you can't understand anything without knowing its 
it's opposite. So I cannot understand cold without understanding warmth. I cannot understand black without understanding white. You cannot understand evil without understanding good. You cannot understand beauty without understanding ugliness. This was Claude Levi Strauss's argument. Now, if you look at this, to the old Sunday evenings at home, with winter outside, coldness, winter standing for loneliness, standing for desertion, and so on. Right, So coldness and so on outside, hostility outside, and hymns in the cozy parlor. You've got the binary opposition there. Okay, In the cozy parlor, whatever is outside there, inside here is security. Outside there's, there's hostility. Inside here th there is security. And hymns in the cozy parlor, the tinkling piano are guide. Now, I want you to note this. The tingling strings, the tinkling piano are guide. Okay, so that is in the past. So now, back to the present. Okay, so now it is vain for the singer to burst into clamor. That's interesting. Okay, now listen, what the word clamor means noise. It means cacophony. Okay, now that is totally in contrast with the tingling strings and the tinkling piano. So it is now vain for the singer to burst into clamor. Her song is not a song. Her song is, the, the present woman's song is not a song. The past woman's song was a song. This is not a song. This is just noise. It's clamor. So now it is vain for the singer to burst into clamor with the great black piano appassionato. Now, people, I understand that many people have in interpreted that word appassionato to mean a particular kind of a piano, like a grand piano and so on. I don't think that is that at all. I think it is a, it is a, uh, it, uh, Italian because D.H. Lawrence spent a lot of time in Italy and he loved the place. So he is using an, an Italian word here. Okay, so you're talking intertextuality basically, but he is using a, 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 an Italian word here. Now, the word appassionato with a great black piano, appassionato. Now, appassionato would come from something like this. You get the word theos, which means God. Right. And from that word, you get the word theist. That's a person who believes in God. And then you add the you, you add the prefix a and you get atheist. Atheist is a person who does not believe in God. Apply the same principle here. Right. With the great black piano, appassionato, that is without passion. With the great black piano, appassionato, with no passion. Contrast that with the pressing the small poised feet of a mother who smiles as she sings. The woman of the past is emotional, okay, who smiles as she, as she sings. And you know something, uh, music without emotion is, is stripped of all its aesthetics, okay? And, uh, you know, I, I, used to, I used to quote this as an example. I used to give of the particular example of one particular singer, uh, uh, and uh, the singer was usually Shalim Dion. Shalim Dion, the person who sang uh, the famous uh, song for the Titanic, right? My heart will go on. But, and I used to say this, I have videos of her singing with the Bee Gees and so on. Okay, now I would not rate, I mean, of course, my, I'm, I'm definitely not a musician. I listen to, listen to music, but I'm not a musician. And I still remember this, the, uh, 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 student friends of mine who are brilliant musicians have told me that her range of, of pitches is fantastic. I don't know about all that. But where I'm concerned, Celine Dion is not a wonderful singer. right? But what brings life to her songs as she performs is the emotion she's able to bring in. Her face takes all sorts of contortions as she sings. And it's not simply, and that is the reason why you should not just listen to Celine Dion, you've got to watch her. Right? And when you do that, the, the, the depth of the song changes completely. Okay, so the point here is this. So it is now, it, it is vain. It, so now it is vain for the singer to burst into clamor with the great black piano with no emotions. Whereas the woman of the past smiles as she sings. Okay, the glamour. Okay, that's an interesting word. The word glamour is a word which is connected with our English word grammar, okay? 
and the two words grammar and glamour come, come from the same Anglo-Saxon root, right? And the word at, at that time, this was commonly used in Anglo-Saxon language. And the, 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 the phrase that was used is casting a glam, okay? Casting a glam means casting a spell, casting a spell. And that is exactly, and that is exactly what you get in gram and grammar. Okay, because that here, it is casting a spell using language. Okay, so, uh, for, uh, sorry, yeah. With the great black man, the glamour of childish days is upon me. We are still in the present. So now it is vain for the singer to burst into clamour with the great black piano, a passionato. The glamour of childish days is upon me. We've gone back to the past. We've gone back to the past. The magic, the spell of the past has been cast upon me and I've gone back into the past. Of childish days, of childhood days is back upon me. Is upon me. My manhood cast, I am no longer this gentleman sitting over here listen, listening to my girlfriend play a piano and sing. I'm not that. I'm the child sitting in the boom of the tinkling strings. Okay, of childish days is upon me. My manhood is cast down the flood of remembrance. Okay, so it is like I've been swept off. I've been swept off by two things. One, by the music of the past. Two, the woman of the past. Down <coughs> the flood of, flood of remembrance, I weep like a child for the past. Okay, so the last phrase, we are back to the present. Okay, now if you're going to look at this poem structurally, and this is what I used to tell my students to do, I used to say, check the number of lines which are in the past and the number of lines that are in the present. And I used to tell them, make a note of it. Okay, so softly in the dusk, a woman is singing to me, present, taking me back down the vista of years till I see past, uh, sorry, transition. So that's neither here nor there. So out, you can't count that. A child sitting. A child sitting under the piano, the boom of the tingling strings and pressing the small poised feet of a mother who smiles as she sings. Now, both those lines are in time past. In spite of myself, the insidious mastery of song uh, betrays me back till the heart of me, that is, both those lines are in the present. And it is talking about the music of the present. Then... To the, to the old Sunday evenings at home with winter outside and hymns in the cozy parlor, the tinkling piano, our guide. So that, again, two lines in time past. All right. So we've got four lines in time past right now. Uh, so now it is vain It is vain for the singer to burst into clamor with the great black piano, a passionato. So we've got two lines. That, um, it, it is one and a half lines, actually which is in the present. The glamour of childish days that is past, all right, is upon me and my manhood that's present, that's present, uh, is cast down in the flood of remembrance. I weep like a child for the past. Now, if you're going to look at that and if you're going to look at the structure, who is more important? The woman of the past or the woman of the present? The woman appassionato or the woman who smiles? Which is more effective? The interesting thing is, the one thing that stays, the one semin, the one sign that stays absolutely neutral in both past and present is the music. The music is what casts the glam on him. Okay. Uh, so the insidious mastery of song. Okay. That is the only thing in the past and in the present is the same thing. The problem is the performers, the entities, or the signs or the samims that are performing these songs are what, what make the difference. Okay, now, actually speaking, if I had the time, I wanted to do a, I wanted to do a cultural uh, structural uh, analysis as well of, uh, of Barbie dolls. Unfortunately, I don't have the time for that now. It's seven o'clock already, I've overshot by half now. So I should bring this talk to an end. Uh, that, is there anybody who wants to make a remark or ask a question, please make it very brief. If there's anybody who wants to uh, make a remark or to or to ask a question. Yes, sir. We have Dr. Ponnivalavan waiting here, sir. Okay. He wants to give you a feedback. But before that, sorry about the time limit, sir. I know it's like bottling up a cataclysm. 
it's okay. But, it uh, is actually. It has <laughs> been actually. Okay, sir. So I now call upon Dr. Ponni Valavan to say a few words. It's actually his feedback on the session. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, forgive my voice. I have a sore throat. Sir, uh, it was a pleasure listening to you after a long time. Okay. Uh, sir, if at all I could use one word to describe your lecture, it is intense. Okay. Uh, sir, I like the way you address the nitty gritty of structuralism. Okay. Uh, I like uh, all your practical examples because in class it will be really helpful for us to uh, uh, say teach structuralism to students. Good, thank you so much. And uh, finally, your structuralist analysis of D. H. Lawrence's piano is a classic, sir. It's a classic, and uh, I'll watch it once again on YouTube, sir. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. I hope it is useful for you in class. Is there anybody who else who has a question or anything to say? Is there anybody else? If not, uh, Dr. Dhanalakshmi as well as Dr. Madhavi, yes, sir. Thank you so much. Yes, yes, sir. We have someone waiting to give a formal vote of thanks, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you. Now I call upon Dr. S. Gomati, Assistant Professor from the Department of English, to deliver the vote of thanks. A very good evening to all. It gives me an immense pleasure to deliver the oath of thanks for this FTP on literary theory. I would like to thank our resource person, Professor Daniel David, head, Department of English, Madras Christian College, a distinguished scholar and repository of knowledge. Sir, you have indeed given a clear insight of the complex critical theory structuralism in a simple and lucid manner. You have demystified the nightmare structuralism, tracing its origin from Ferdinand de Saussure, who laid its foundations to other intellectuals like Claude Lévi-Strauss, Sigmund Freud, Carl Jung, and others, evincing the concepts related to it with fine examples. So you are really an epitome of proficiency in literature. We are honored by your presence, sir. My sincere thanks to our beloved Dean, Dr. R. Padmavati, for her support in all our endeavors. My heartfelt gratitude to our head, Dr. Sushil Mary Matthews, who drives us together with a pleasant smile. I express my special thanks and appreciation to Dr. V. Madhiki, Staff Coordinator, Literary and Debating Association, for her sincere and strenuous efforts in bringing all the inspirational and exemplary speakers to us. I would like to express my gratitude to my colleagues and participants from various institutions for their overwhelming response and enthusiastic participation. My wholehearted thanks to our dear Kavya for lending a helping hand for technical support. Once again, I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ever so much until we meet again. Uh, yes, ma'am, sure. There's somebody thank called Pratima Patel who's raising a hand. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. Okay, sir. Uh, Ma'am, can you get me feedback, please? Sure, sir. I will. Uh, we are sending a link, sir. I will send you the select feedback, sir. I will.